Hello and welcome to our virtual EMS conference series. My name is Eric Cortez and I serve as the system EMS medical director for Ohio Health. I am joined by our system EMS director, Holly Heron, and our system EMS manager, Barb Dean. We are excited you have joined us for this important EMS update. The virtual conference will last for approximately two hours. We have several quick hitting high yield presentations delivered by several of our EMS physicians and trauma surgeon. Please refer to our website for more information regarding continuing education for this event. We, in fact, have an all star lineup for you. Starting from the top, we have Dr. Beery, who will be discussing a very interesting trauma case. Dr. Kelnell will provide an overview on cancer emergencies. Dr. Anders will discuss transplant emergencies. This will be followed by Dr. Barr covering the very important topic of sickle cell emergencies. Dr. Fault will discuss the very nerve wracking complications of pre hospital hypertension patients. Dr. Casey will cover important emergencies that occur in alcoholics. And last but not least, Dr. Ann Dietrich will discuss pediatric anaphylaxis, an emergency that we need to treat flawlessly in order to optimize outcomes. Thank you all for taking part in this conference. You are all the experts on this content and I'm honored and excited that you're here with us today for the virtual conference. With that, we will transition over and we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Beery and our trauma case. Dr. Beery, thanks for joining us and I'll hand over everything to you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Beery. I'm one of the trauma surgeons at Grant Medical Center. And very excited to get to talk to you today about this uh, case, that, a very recent case, actually, we just had not that long ago. So we'll go ahead and get started. So pre-hospital with this patient, EMS was dispatched to the scene of a 33-year-old female who was involved in a motor vehicle collision. Uh, EMS uh, arrived on the scene and upon arrival, they found that the vehicle was located actually in a ravine that was uh, eight feet down off of the roadway. Uh, in order to extricate the patient, um, fire and EMS providers uh, had to put the patient on a backboard and they had to uh, slide her up a roof ladder. Uh, once they were able to get her completely extricated and um, up off out of the ravine, uh, the patient was noted to be unresponsive with a glass calcoma scale of three. You can see her vital signs here. So she was not tachycardic. Her heart rate was 76. However, her, her blood pressure was uh, borderline 95 over 55, but she was tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 41. And she was hypoxic. And you can see with the end tidal CO2 as well there. Um, so because her GCS was uh, eight or less, um, she underwent uh, rapid sequence intubation with video laryngoscopy. Um, they established uh, IVs and uh, started a normal saline. Um, also, um, she was given epi uh, times one uh, for declining heart rate. So she's becoming bradycardic and hypotensive. So symptomatic bradycardia. Uh, due to decreased breast sound, she underwent needle decompression on uh, both sides and they had copious amounts of blood on the right specifically um, whenever they uh, put the catheters in. Upon reassessment, now they had an airway, breathing, um, circulation. Uh, so she had, you know, um, normal vital signs at that point, essentially. Um, but she still had a GCS of three and bilateral pupillary constriction that were non-reactive. She still had decreased breath sounds bilaterally, but they were present. So she arrived at the trauma bay as a level one trauma because she uh, had, um, Waxing and waning vital signs, but additionally, because she had a, uh, an airway that had been established. So you can see here her injuries included after um, her trauma evaluation and her CT imaging, which I'll show you a couple of those here in a minute. She had a non displaced fracture involving the clivus, which is at the base of the skull, bilateral temple bone fractures, bilateral occipital bone fractures. Uh, she had bilateral subarachnoid hemorrhages, subdural hematoma intraparenchymal hematoma and open calvarial fracture. She did have a right hemoneumothorax, um, a chest wall injury on that side, uh, multiple rib fractures um, on the right side. Um, the, her splenic uh, on imaging, it looked like, couldn't tell really if she had a splenic cleft or a laceration. Sometimes the, 
the anatomy of the spleen makes it hard to always tell if there's a laceration or not, but there was certainly no blush. And uh, a grade two BCVI, so blunt cerebral vascular injury of her left internal carotid. Uh, here you can see, I'll go back to the trauma bay activation. I think you could, there you can see on her right side, she did have a, a pneumothorax. Um, in the trauma bay, we were able to confirm that she had appropriate ETT, ET tube placement. And you can see there, um, I think, hopefully you can see if I'm sharing the, the mouse pointer there, there's the tip of the ET tube. It's above the carina, it's appropriate. Um, and you can see she's got this pneumothorax kind of apical and extending out here. Um, so she underwent right chest tube placement. She got, uh, they got uh, not really blood, but they got air back. So the other thing I would point out on this x-ray, if you look kind of at the base over the right hemi diaphragm, there's a little bit of air there and also immediately there's air. So um, you can kind of see that pneumothorax is there as well. Uh, she was still hypercarbic on her venous blood gas. Uh, so they had to increase her minute ventilation a little bit uh, on the vent by that point. So then she underwent the CT scans. Uh, I mentioned the injuries she already had and was admitted to the intensive care unit. Here you can see her um, couple of, of uh, slices from her head CT. Um, most importantly, you can see kind of outside of her skull, she's got a little bit of blood there, cephalohematoma there. You can see which side she was hit on. But then uh, more significantly, if you look on the inside there, you can see that um, it doesn't look the same on both sides. So she does have some cerebral edema and a little bit of, of shift of the midline, uh, not enough to warrant um, operative intervention, but certainly something that um, she needed kind of aggressive uh, therapy for her traumatic brain injury. So once she was admitted to the intensive care unit, um, neurosurgery was consulted, as I mentioned, non-operative management. We just had to watch her very closely. Uh, orthopedics was consulted for um, a patella fracture and a uh, tailor and a tibial fracture. And once she was stabilized from a hemodynamic and neurologic standpoint, uh, they took her to the OR to repair that. Um, because she still hadn't really awakened uh, and that head CT doesn't really explain why she wasn't waking up, she did under, uh, undergo an MRI which showed an evolving acute infarct. Uh, as well as um, I mentioned earlier, uh, a BC guide or left internal carotid, well, it, it uh, had kind of evolved a little bit, became a grade three. Um, still nothing uh, to really do, but um, we did consult uh, neurointerventional radiology at Riverside, because uh, those guys have a few uh, extra tricks up their sleeve too, uh, for possible intervention because of this, um, this uh, evolving stroke. So she did get transferred from Grant to the neuro ICU at Riverside. Um, the stroke response team was consulted there. Um, physical medicine and rehab was also consulted for inpatient rehab uh, for her cognitive deficits because she was waking up a little bit, but still not okay yet. Uh, she has some gait disturbances um, and visual disturbances as well as her uh, traumatic brain injury. She is still hospitalized at Riverside in the neurocritical care unit, but she is pending discharge to acute inpatient rehab at this point. So, you know, in summary, uh, she was a uh, motor vehicle crash uh, patient that was found in a ravine and extricated and uh, appropriately recognized that she needed an airway pre-hospital uh, given appropriate resuscitation um, with um, meds and also started on a normal saline uh, at sort of a mini hyperosmolar type therapy, at least uh, you know, there's a debate about normal saline versus lactated ringers um, pre-hospital, and I think uh, normal saline is still kind of the way to go uh, when we're worried about cerebral edema in a traumatic brain injury patient. And um, so far, so good. With that, I would welcome any questions that anyone else has. I'm going to stop sharing here. Dr. Beery, that was great. Uh, panelists uh, and presenters, do we have any questions for Dr. Beery? Hey, Dr. Beery, Drew Kelno. You mentioned a little bit at the end, um, normal saline versus lactated ringers, and, and I'm with you with the normal saline part, but do you wanna maybe expand on that a little bit, what the controversy actually is uh, for those that maybe aren't aware? 
And I think you're still on mute, Dr. Beery. There we go. There go. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. So I think that the controversy is primarily when we talk about normal saline versus lactated ringers, are those both truly isotonic? Because we talk about uh, isotonic resuscitation. We do not want hypotonic resuscitation. So we certainly don't want half normal saline, anything like that, because we want to be able to volume expand the patient. But we also don't want to worsen any of the traumatic brain injury. So uh, a chemist would tell you that, relatively speaking, lactated ringers is slightly hypotonic compared to normal saline, uh, number one. Uh, many of the patients that do have a traumatic brain injury and cerebral edema, once we get them in the intensive care unit and we have monitoring available, whether it's an EVD, uh, some kind of ICP monitoring, many of those patients may get hyperosmolar therapy. We may give them 3%. Um, they'll even go up to 24.5%. We don't typically do that um, to try to manage that cerebral edema. But the, the, the risk of the normal saline is that if you give enough normal saline, then you also create some other metabolic disturbances. They get a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, which in ICU patients uh, increases the risk of them developing acute renal failure, acute kidney injury because of that. So then you're, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So there's actually uh, some pretty good data uh, from several years ago. I think the most recent one was in 2014, actually comparing lactated ringers and 0.9 in the pre-hospital setting for patients with traumatic brain injury. That was a subset of the SMART trial, if I remember right. Um, and that showed an increased mortality uh, in patients with traumatic brain injury that got pre-hospital lactated ringers versus pre-hospital normal saline. So I think the my my bias, and I think you said it too, Dr. Kalnow, my, my bias is for the normal saline, at least up front, um, because usually it's only a liter or two that should not create that hyperchloric metabolic acidosis. So certainly in the pre-hospital phase, that would be appropriate. And then once we have uh, more invasive monitoring or imaging that we have once they get to the trauma bay and the intensive care unit, then we can kind of titrate or decide what to use. I'm also a big fan of plasma light, um, but that's not really been studied as much. Um, the pharmacist will tell you that it used to cost a lot more, so we used to restrict it. The, the cost difference now between that and uh, 0.9 or LR is pretty negligible now. Dr. Beery, to follow up on that, this patient was an example of somebody with traumatic brain injury as well as multi-system trauma. And sometimes EMS hears conflicting messages about permissive hypotension versus avoiding hypotension in the setting of TBI. Do you have any advice on, on how we can approach an undifferentiated trauma patient that may have both? And how do we, how do we guide the amount of fluids that we give based on those two somewhat competing concepts? Well, that's another good question. So, um, yes, the TBI, as far as blood pressure and perfusion, uh, kind of takes priority. So, a lot of times the idea of permissive hypotension is really because the patient has bleeding somewhere that we can't necessarily get to in the pre hospital uh, state. But once we get them to uh, the trauma bay and maybe the operating room, we can control that bleeding. So, that's where the concept of the permissive hypotension or the pop the clot phenomenon. You don't wanna crank up their pressures and, and push a clot out of a vessel that's bleeding. Uh, that being said, uh, as you mentioned, a traumatic brain injury patient, um, they will not tolerate hypotension. So uh, it has been well supported in literature and now even uh, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. Um, a single episode of a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 at any point in the patient's hospitalization decreases their functional neurologic outcome following a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. So it's very important we avoid hypotension in a patient with a suspected or confirmed traumatic brain injury for that reason. Also, um, the other part to that is also in those patients, a single oxygen saturation of less than 90% also has a negative impact on their functional neurologic outcome after traumatic brain injury. So the fact like in this case that EMS secured the airway quickly and you know, took care of the uh, pneumothoraces quickly, uh, that, that improves the, patient, the patient's overall uh, functional neurologic outcome, we hope. 
um, it certainly um, optimizes their chances. So yeah, so when there's competing priorities, um, permissive hypotension is one of those things that um, I usually advocate. If you know the trajectory of the bullet and it doesn't go through their brain, <laughs> I'm okay with permissive hypotension to a point. Uh, otherwise, you gotta really reconsider whether, whether uh, permissive hypotension is the way to go because if there's any chance they have a traumatic brain injury, that patient is not a candidate for any kind of hypotension. It will impact their outcome. Eric, you're on mute too. There you go. You figure I would get this right at some point. So. Dr. Beer, I, I just wanted to thank you. That was a great presentation and I, th I think a lot of learning points for our pre-hospital providers. So thank you very much for your time and uh, your participation in this. Um, before we transition over to Dr. Kelno, I wanted to just um, make a note that if any of the listeners have any questions, we felt really bad about not being able to have live interaction with questions, but if you do, Contact Ohio Health EMS. You can contact me at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com and I'll get your questions to the presenters and we'll be in touch with you as soon as possible. Um, so, without any further delay, we'll get started uh, or, or we'll move on to our second presentation with Dr. Kelno and he'll be talking about cancer emergencies. Thank you, Drew. Thanks, Eric. All right, let's share some content. Get that to work first. All right, good deal. Uh, well, I'm Drew Kelno. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug before I even uh, get too far into this, which is uh, Dr. Cortez, who is uh, emceeing this, uh, myself, and then another EM uh, physician, uh, Dave Schneider, uh, host a podcast for Ohio Health EMS called The Canon. If you haven't checked that out, that's another really uh, fun way to get some uh, CE credit through Ohio Health free. We do an hour every month broken into two sessions. So would appreciate uh, anyone interested in getting to see that way to check it out and give us some feedback and ideas for topics. Uh, it's uh, new as of the last maybe uh, five, six months or so. So we're trying to get better at it. The links are on the Ohio Health EMS website. You can find us on SoundCloud and we're working on getting that rolled out to some other uh, podcasting platforms too. So. Um, I'm an EM provider uh, with Ohio Health, work mainly on the west side at Doctors Hospital uh, and an EMS medical director through Ohio Health also. And we're going to talk about cancer. And, and this is a, a huge topic. And we're going to talk about it in 10 minutes. And we're not going to cover uh, a ton of detail. And the reality is, from an EMS standpoint, we don't need a lot of detail. We just need to know what to do uh, with emergencies and how to manage patients that have maybe a cancer diagnosis or concerning diagnosis. But before we can do that, we kind of have to understand how cancer works and, and what we're actually talking about. So this is um, from the World Health Organization. So this is a global view of uh, cancer diagnosis back in 2018, the most recent data that we have um, for this. And um, what you can see is that, that lung cancer is by far the leading cause of cancer worldwide. And we're going to see that this holds true with U.S. cases also, although maybe not quite as dramatically as uh, we see worldwide. And the big reason for this is smoking. Uh, the number one cause of lung cancer is cigarette smoke. Uh, there's lots of other things that cause it also, but, but cigarette smoke is going to be a, a big part of that. And then we'll see that uh, breast cancer is very pop. Um, prevalent both worldwide in the U.S. And, and prostate cancer in the U.S., although a little less so maybe worldwide. And, and part of that has to do with the fact that prostate cancer is a diagnosis that we typically get later in life. And so life expectancy in non-first world countries is significantly less. So prostate cancer actually happens to be a cancer diagnosis of first world countries, not third world countries um, a little bit. So let's dial that down a little bit to see what this looks like. Um, in the US specifically. So if we look at cancer cases, new cases for males, it's prostate cancer. For females, it's breast cancer. Now, both of those cancer diagnoses actually come with a pretty decent um, outlook if they are caught early enough. Uh, there's lots of treatments for both breast cancer and for and for prostate cancer. They go anywhere from um, 
radiation therapy, chemotherapy, radical prostatectomies or mastectomies where we take out the prostate, we take out the breast um, to prevent spread depending on how far along things are. And that's why we do screening for, for men, males, they get PSA tests and uh, the very un, unpleasant but necessary rectal exam at your primary care physician's office. And for females, it's breast exam and it's mammograms. And these are really important. You see breast can or lung cancer is uh, very prevalent both in males and females. And when you talk about estimated deaths, lung cancer uh, by far uh, takes, takes it uh, much more than most of those. The other pretty populous uh, cancer as far as deaths go is gonna be pancreatic cancer, both in males and females, as well as colorectal cancer from a male and female standpoint. Uh, pancreatic cancer oftentimes is uh, the most unfortunate of those because the, uh, the mortality rate with that and the timing of that uh, is, is pretty, pretty bad. So what does that mean for us in EMS? Well. All that just means that we're gonna have a lot of patients potentially that have cancer. And, and the question that we really need to ask ourselves are two things, uh, acute versus chronic and stable versus unstable. And the stable versus unstable question is a question that EMS asks itself every time they walk up to a patient. And that's the same thing we do in emergency medicine. Is the patient stable or are they unstable? Because our treatment, our interventions, our approach, our speed of transport is gonna change dramatically uh, based on that. From acute versus chronic, uh, really the question is, are we worried about some type of new cancer diagnosis or does the patient have a recent diagnosis and they're decompensating quickly or is this more of a chronic issue and it's maybe uh, as much due to therapies that are going on or comorbidities as it is cancer itself. So uh, we don't have to make a cancer diagnosis. We're not gonna make a cancer diagnosis by any means in the field, but we have to have a little bit of an understanding of, of what is going on with that. So from an EMS standpoint, we need to ask some questions. So if the patient has cancer, they have a known diagnosis, then we just wanna find that out. That's kind of uh, question number one, information number one is what type of cancer do you have? What's your diagnosis? And to an extent, what's your prognosis? Because that leads into question number two. And question number two is, are you getting treatment? So if you are getting treatment, what kind of treatment you have? Because this is important information as far as what we concerned for being a potential emergency for these patients. Cancer itself probably isn't the emergency, but is it a complication either of the cancer or the therapy that they are undergoing? So are you getting radiation? Are you getting chemotherapy? Are you on a hormone supplement, uh, which lots and lots of uh, cancers now, particularly prostate cancer, breast cancer, and some other ones are responsive to different types of hormones. And then when was your last treatment? Have you experienced these, these symptoms before? So again, this is kind of that acute or chronic issue. If this is an ongoing issue for you, you know, every time you get chemotherapy, you get very fatigued, you have bouts of nausea. What we need to do is get you fluid hydrated, get some nausea control, transport you to the hospital to make sure your electrolytes are okay, versus you've never had this before and this is a potentially a much more acute complication. Two more questions you wanna ask is, where do you receive your care? Um, this is really important when we're in a place um, in an urban center like Columbus, Ohio, where that may impact transport destination. You know, if somebody receives all their care at a specific facility, maybe that's the facility they need to go to, particularly when we're working with a cancer diagnosis as opposed to just the closest facility. Now, most appropriate facility still holds true. So if the patient's really unstable, then we need to get them to the closest, most appropriate facility. And then that ED or that hospital can deal with transfer later if it's needed. But if you have a little more time, the patient's a little more stable and they can handle going a little farther down the road, taking them at least to the system they receive care, if not the institution they receive care, probably is in the patient's best interest. And at the end of the day, that's really what we need to do as EMS providers. And then final question you wanna ask, if a patient's a little farther along, um, do they have a, a DNR status? Uh, are they on hospice or palliative care? Because that can help decide and, and affect uh, treatment uh, for these patients and, and how we're going to approach and finish these things. So there are a few emergencies uh, when we're talking about cancer. I'm gonna to try to break these up into really three systems or three different um, approaches. This is by no means inclusive, but um, try to give you the, the highlights in, in a quick presentation so we can drive through and take care of these cancer patients. So the first one I wanna think about is the respiratory system, uh, breathing and shortness of breath is the complaint. A patient has a history of cancer uh, diagnosis and um, they're complaining of shortness of breath. And so this is probably the most common true emergency we're gonna see in EMS from a, a cancer-related diagnosis. And um, the question we're always gonna ask ourselves whenever there's a breathing compromise, is there airway concerns? We need to move quickly to take the airway and what can we do to supplement breathing? Um, and patients work of breathing 
so that we can keep them as stable as possible. It's a huge differential. The good news is the treatment for these differentials is essentially the same. We're going to support with oxygen therapy if their uh, oxygen saturations are not very good. And we're going to support their work of breathing first and foremost. Uh, that's going to be with oxygen therapy if they need it. And then if they need something more aggressive, we're going to go with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So for most EMS providers, that's going to be CPAP. And then if we absolutely have to, we'll go into intubation. So let's talk a little bit about what the differential diagnosis could be in these patients because it's pretty big and it's going to encompass a lot of different things. And some of those questions we talked about initially uh, a couple of slides ago can help narrow in on what the potential diagnosis is. So when I have a, a cancer patient with shortness of breath come into my ED, one of the first things I worry about is do they have a PE, a pulmonary embolism, a clot in the lungs. And cancer patients are at particular risk for this, um, particularly if they're receiving hormone therapy even more so. So when we think of our clotting triad, you know, stasis. So if the patient is uh, not as mobile as they used to be, that's certainly a concern. Um, and then when you throw in hormones to attack um, or maybe mitigate the cancer um, progression, then that falls much into the same way as oral contraceptives for a female, and it can cause uh, increased clotting cascade issues to go on. The next question or the next diagnosis that I often think about is if a patient's receiving radiation anywhere in the area of the torso is do they have radiation lung? Um, and that's where assimilation a presentation very similar to COPD is going to occur, uh, but it's not going to be as responsive to our typical COPD treatments. And it's essentially scarring and um, inflammatory response acutely in the lungs from the radiation therapy. Although I say acutely because this is a really weird process. Sometimes it happens in short term after receiving radiation therapy, sometimes there's a delay weeks or even months after receiving radiation therapy and the, the body, the lungs in particular, is decide to, to have a reaction to it. And so these patients will be tight and wheezy and, and have poor lung uh, air volumes. And, and so we're gonna approach that very much the same way we do, we do a COPD patient and see what we can do for them. The, the last one I'm going to talk about from a, a respiratory compromise is a pretty uncommon but can be very dramatic and, and very concerning process, which is called SVC syndrome. So superior vena cava syndrome, which is where you get a mass either in the lungs or in the neck that becomes large enough where it compresses the superior vena cava. But in that situation, not only are you going to have hemodynamic issues, but the mass then starts to push on the airway too and can cause uh, airway compromise and failure. And this could be a patient that potentially even intubation doesn't work very well for because we can't pass an ET tube all the way through and, and you're looking at potentially an emergent crike on them. Now, this would be very rare. Most of the time you would actually have, have that diagnosis already. Um, but uh, something to think about. And I apologize. Apparently, I'm getting some uh, feedback in the mic behind me. I don't or in my mic. I don't know what's going on. Um, same setup I typically have. So I'm just going to disconnect and reconnect my headphones real quick and, and see if that doesn't help. All right. That's all the troubleshooting I know how to do real quick without getting totally out of the presentation. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, next thing, and, and we'll move through this pretty quickly. So if I do have uh, some bad feedback, you guys aren't stuck with me. Uh, altered mental status. So this is a really tricky one. And, and again, your potential causes of this in a cancer patient are, are really wide. Sometimes this is a primary brain issue, can be caused by a rapidly progressing tumor or something along those lines, or it could be another issue causing um, secondary concerns. So when we think about altered mental status, we're going to go anywhere from an issue going on with the brain to an issue going on with uh, the electrolytes in the body, or maybe even just dehydration. So recent treatment can cause nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea. These patients get really behind on their fluid intake and confusion is due to dehydration. So in this situation and in altered mental status, and the next one we're going to talk about after this is fluids. Get them hydrated, get their symptoms under control. Hypercalcemia, um, which is where your calcium levels go way up in, in your blood. And about a third of cancer patients will develop some type of uh, hypercalcemia uh, while they're receiving treatment. Most commonly, uh, the, the cancers that we're talking about in this situation are multiple myeloma, lung cancer, renal cancer, and breast cancer to cause it. And, and what causes it isn't necessarily, um, isn't necessarily important, but the way the patient presents is, uh, is uh, really an interesting thing. So they're going to be almost like a kidney stone presentation because maybe they do have kidney stones. They're going to be moaning and pain and groaning because they're discomfort and kind of confused. Um, so 
the treatment for this is IV fluids. You also might pick up some EKG changes, uh, which would be a shortened QTC uh, interval. So when you're looking at that, if you pick that up on your EKG, that can be another clue what's going on. And then if you have a primary brain issue going on, then increased intracranial pressure and herniation can be issues themselves causing altered mental status or decreased uh, mental status specifically. In those situations, we're going to look for a blown pupil, uh, abnormal neuro exam, truly depressed level of consciousness. Um, and if we have any of those concerns, just like any other brain bleed or increased intracranial pressure in that, we want to elevate the head of the bed, think about hyperventilation or intubation of these patients. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about one other neuro issue, even though it's not primary a brain issue, which is you can certainly get spinal cord syndromes uh, when we talk about neuro issues too. So if the patient has caudal like presentation, um, if they have um, mets to the bones, you can get uh, spinal uh, column destruction where they have collapse of your spinal column or maybe a uh, cancerous process or growth pushing directly on the spinal cord. All right, one more system or process to think about a little bit. Um, so this is going to kind of go into the renal issue and, and more in the electrolyte issue. And we're going to talk about dehydration one more time because most often what we're going to see in these patients is dehydration, secondary to poor PO intake, maybe nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And again, fluid, fluid, fluid is the way we want to go on this. So um, rehydrate the patient, get their symptoms under control. But if they have a, a cancer, abdominal cancer, um, prostate cancer, renal cancer, obstruction is a possibility too, either from an enlarged prostate or a mass pushing on the ureters or potentially obstructing urinary output in some other reason. Um, and in that situation, the issue isn't because they are fluid depleted, but they literally cannot urinate and they become uremic, um, which leads to a whole um, uh, slew of bad stuff mainly renal failure in that situation. And the last one to think about is something called tumor lysis syndrome. Again, fluids are the answer to this, but this is essentially where you get pretty severe electrolyte and metabolic derangements secondary to treatment for cancer from rapid uh, cancer cell destruction. And we basically clog up the filter of the kidneys. Um, so uh, fluids, fluids, fluids in those situations. Again, maybe the second most or potentially the most common comp uh, complaint that we're going to get is going to be pain in these patients. Um, we can dive into this much more uh, on another talk, which hopefully we'll get to do, but make sure that you control these patients' uh, pain. Uh, they, some of them are on aggressive pain regimens already. Some of them are not, um, but the pain can be immense and intense in cancer patients. And this is not a patient to be uh, judicious on as far as pain control goes. We want to make sure that we're controlling their pain appropriately. Um, not so much worried in the situation about abuse or addiction issues in our cancer patients. All right, let's uh, wrap it up uh, with uh, really a, a final uh, public safety announcement, which is first line uh, providers, frontline providers, we are at higher risk uh, for cancer, particularly firefighters, due to the uh, just the nature of our job. So some things, and, and I was a former firefighter, uh, so I, I understand this firsthand and, and how devastating cancer can be is make sure we're wearing proper respiratory protection when we're in any uh, environment where there might be uh, off-gassing, smoke, anything like that. Immediately decon uh, and deconning ourselves by taking a shower and deconning our gear uh, after we've been in those situations. And then keeping a log of your exposure because if we are going to get cancer from uh, job exposures, we want to make sure that uh, that is documented and have protection. You know, no longer is it cool to have uh, smoke-stained uh, gear because that shows that you were in the fire the, the cleaner the gear, the better, because that's safe for us, and, and we certainly want to mitigate our cancer. Again, I apologize for the audio issues. I'm not sure what was going on there, um, but uh, thanks so much, and, and look forward to uh, to coming back. I'm going to stop sharing and happy to, to answer any questions. Last thing is, if uh, you want to get uh, some more information on what I was talking about and just read the slides yourself, uh, take a picture of this QR code on your phone, and that will link you uh, directly to my presentation and everything else going on. Hey, thanks, Drew. That was that was excellent. A lot of great information there. I love the office reference. I think that should be a requirement in all presentations. So great job with that too. Um, Specifically for you, Eric. <laughs> before we get into some questions, I did want to just take this opportunity to introduce to you our two EMS fellows. So Natalie and Janine, if you can turn your cameras on, um, I'd like to just introduce you guys to uh, to the group and stuff. So we have uh, Dr. Janine Curcio and Dr. Natalie Ferretti. Uh, Janine and Natalie are our two EMS fellows this year at Ohio Health. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a fellow is, it's basically uh, 
uh, an ER physician that's doing an extra year of training, learning how to be an EMS medical director. So Janine and uh, Natalie are uh, actually taking their board exams for emergency medicine, I believe, next week. So good luck with that. Uh, I'm sure you guys will do great. Uh, but they're doing an extra year of training, again, focusing on emergency medical services. So Janine and Natalie, uh, take a second to just give a little bit of background about um, about yourself. And then if you have any questions for Dr. Kelno about the presentations, feel, feel free to ask those questions. Uh, Janine, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Natalie. Hi, I'm Janine Curcio. Um, I recently graduated from the Doctors Hospital Emergency Medicine Residency. Before that, I went to LECOM, which is Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. And this is actually my second career even before that. I was active duty Navy for eight years uh, prior to going into medicine. Thanks, Janine. Natalie? Hi, uh, I'm Natalie. I uh, am originally from West Virginia. I did my emergency medicine residency um, here at Ohio State um, and now doing the fellowship, just um, hoping to be a medical director and be involved in pre-hospital care in the future. Um, so I can uh, start with a question. Thanks, Drew, for um, doing that topic. Um, I think it was interesting because it's a topic that we don't often talk about and include in um, EMS education frequently. But like you mentioned, it's really important to recognize um, that some of these complications can actually be um, emergencies. Um, and you briefly mentioned the importance of getting that info if a patient has advanced directives. I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit more on a situation where um, a patient with advanced disease, they have a DNR, maybe they're on hospice. Um, you know, sometimes they or the family members might call EMS. And how do you instruct your providers to navigate these situations um, with, you know, the EMS responsibilities, but also their hospice? Yeah, Natalie, that's a great question, and that's a tricky one. You know, typically when a patient's on hospice, um, palliative care, uh, they already have a, a progressive treatment regimen at home. The reason that EMS is getting called is because whatever's happening is outside of the comfort level of the family. Um, maybe this is truly end of life, but the family's just not ready to deal with it uh, themselves. Sometimes the pain control or breathing issues are just beyond something that they feel comfortable with. Remember, you know, lots of times that we put family in charge of care of these patients. Um, there may be home health, home health help, there may not be, um, or they might not be there all the time. So, you know, what I tell my EMS agencies, and, and certainly when somebody comes into the ED with one of these patients, is, is the first thing is not to be frustrated by the call. Um, you know, clearly whatever is going on is exceeded the comfort level of the caretakers. And that's where us as medical providers, whether it's from an EMS standpoint or emergency medicine uh, standpoint, is we need to take over care for that patient. Now, that doesn't mean that we do all these life-saving procedures. If they have a DNR and that's clearly... Um, outlined, then then we respect that and we honor that. But we try to make the patient comfortable. We try to make the family comfortable. And, and I think if there's any concern whatsoever, that patient just gets transported to the hospital so that there's higher level of care available for that patient. Uh, remember, we have treatment options that aren't available at home, and we can certainly get our hospice and palliative teams involved from a, a hospital standpoint, too, to help further take care and certainly clarify goals of care in those patients, which from an EMS standpoint, we're not going to be able to do. So um, don't be frustrated. Understand that the family is concerned, and that's why they called. And if there's any question whatsoever, just transport them to the most appropriate hospital for them to further uh, take care of the situation. All right. Thanks, Drew. Natalie, that was a great question. Um, we'll plan to uh, transition over to Dr. Anders now. Uh, Bridget, if you're ready, we'll get moving on to transplant emergencies, another important topic. Thanks, Drew. Awesome. All right. All right, so uh, my name is Bridget Anders. I am a emergency medicine um, doctor working at Doctors Hospital. Um, did my training here in Columbus at Ohio State as well. So we are going to talk about transplant emergencies. And I think this oftentimes can feel like a super subspecialty thing that, um, you know, there's there's tons of specialists for really complicated. And I think maybe that's true, but I think also this is becoming more and more common. Um, and these 
you know, we've got tons of people that this affects. And so it's important for us to be aware of this. It's important, especially um, working here in Columbus. Um, Ohio State has done 10,500 solid organ transplants. Um, and so these patients exist. Um, they're living longer. We're doing more transplants. Um, and so these, these patients are out in our communities and um, we're going to have runs on them and they're going to have complications and we need to be prepared um, to treat these patients. Um, just a clarifier, this is solid organ transplant, so we're not going to really touch on kind of bone marrow transplants, which has kind of a whole world of its own as far as issues. Um, and so, you know, these are happening. What organs are being transplanted? So the most common organ that's transplanted is the kidney. This makes up about 58% of all transplants. Um, the next organ is the liver, making up about 21%. And then the last two are a much smaller amount. The, the heart is about 8% and the lungs are 5% of transplants. Um, like I said, we're not going to talk about bone marrow. And this also leaves out some other things like a pancreas transplant, um, which you can hear, you know, sometimes people will say they've had KP transplant, which is when they transplant the kidney and the pancreas. Um, but these are kind of the big ones to be aware of. And um, I think just kind of talking through what these have in common and what things we should be thinking about when um, these patients are have an emergency of some kind. Um, so the first thing we need to talk about is what is on everybody's mind. Um, and this is rejection. This is on your patient's mind. It's on their family's minds. Um, this is on their transplant team's mind. Um, and so we have to exist, you know, this exists and this is something that um, there is a you know, permanent risk of for the entire time they have their transplanted organ um, so that we need to be aware of it. Um, it's a huge cause of organ dysfunction and allograft dysfunction. Um, and so it's important to be aware of number one. It's also important to ask about um, because a patient might let you know that, you know, they have a history of rejection and, and now they have decreased function of their renal transplant or something like that. Um, but by and large, we're going to kind of um, brush over this because other than the acute kind of post-operative rejections, rejection often happens pretty chronically. Um, and these patients are worked up outpatient a lot of times initially. Um, so it's important to know about. It's important to ask about um, because it might help you in your management. Um, but a lot of times um, we're not going to see kind of the acute rejections that cause immediate um, you know, acute decompensations, it's going to be more chronic. Um, and I think what else is important is to just think about these patients as um, they're going to have organ dysfunction. That is what rejection is going to cause in them. So if you have a renal transplant patient, you know, history of a kidney transplant, and now that, you know, they tell you their, their provider is worried about rejection, they're being worked up for rejection. Um, you need to, you know, treat them as if, you know, they're now, a, you know, renal, they're in renal failure. So you need to be worried about the things that happen when the, when the kidney isn't functioning. Same thing goes for, you know, if it's a heart transplant patient who you're worried about rejection, then, you know, you need to think about them like a heart failure patient and be worried about all of those things. And the next thing we're going to talk about is probably what happens um, that is an acute issue and the most common acute issue we're going to deal with in these patients and that is infection, 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 infection in these patients um, for a multitude of reasons. So these patients are on lifelong immunosuppression, which is gonna just put them constantly at an increased risk. They had a major operation, which puts them at an increased risk. Um, and their infections are pretty bad and they're common. So um, 25 to 80% of transplant patients have a major infection within the first year post-transplant. Um, so you're talking, you know, nearly um, one in four to, to four out of five of these patients are having a major infection within that first year. Um, and the most common infection is um, caused by a urinary tract infection, and that's in all transplant patients. So it's not just if they had a renal transplant. Um, and so we need to have, you know, high index of suspicion for infection. The most common presenting symptom is fever, but this only happens in about 50% of patients. Um, so not only do their immunosuppressive medications put them at increased risk of, of a pretty horrible infection and bacteremia and kind of just a, a, a widespread fulminant infection from even minor causes of infection, but it also can, you know, alter the way they're going to present, um, you know, 
Fever is the most common thing, but that's only happening in half of these patients. Um, and so we have to be thinking about infection and we have to realize that these patients not only have an increased risk, but they might not look like the normal, horribly septic patient that you're used to seeing. So um, kind of just knowing that they can have a pretty bad infection without looking super sick. Um, obviously they can also look super sick, um, but that you just need to know that that exists as well. The next thing we're going to talk about in the last kind of big category for these patients is medications. So we kind of touched on it in infection, but these patients are on lifelong immunosuppressive medications. Um, and these medications, you know, there have been huge advances in the management of these patients, the medications that are available to these patients and the regimens that they're on in order to allow them to um, not have rejection. But these medications aren't benign. Um, they have toxic side effects, um, and those side effects can be kind of all over the all over the map. Um, they can be medication specific things. You know, you can get nephrotoxicity. Not great if you just had your kidney transplanted. You can have GI bleeding. You can have seizures, tremors, um, confusion, anemia. Um, so these can have really expansive kind of side effect profiles. And they also can have important medication interactions. So um, medication interactions with the other immunosuppressives, um, but oftentimes even just with normal medication. So what does this mean as EMS providers? Um, I think this means that we need to know that they're on these medications and we need to ask about medications um, because I, I think it's impossible to expect um, providers to know all the medications that exist and what the side effect profiles is and what you should be worried about. Um, but we need to be asking, you know, have you had recent changes to your immunosuppressive medications? Have you missed doses? Um, those type of things. And then just asking about medications in general, you know, were you started on any other medications recently? Have you been taking anything over the counter? Um, because those, you know, otherwise benign and, you know, not really, you know, you can think of not related medications are important um, and can have, um, important effects on their immunosuppressives from an interaction standpoint, making them have increased risk and be at toxic levels or decreased risk and increased risk of inject or decreased levels with an increased risk of rejection. So I think ask about it is the big takeaway from medications and then try to get an updated med list or bring those medications with them. Um, so that, you know, as things are teased out in the ER and with their admission, they can kind of figure out what the role of those medications was. So those are the big kind of three big categories, but we're going to talk about some kind of just fast facts on these transplant patients. Um, number one, kidney transplants live in the pelvis. So um, when these patients have a kidney transplant, that new kidney is put in the lower abdomen and in the pelvis. Um, this is important because if you, you know, these are oftentimes easily palpable um, if they're, and if they're having belly pain, now their um, transplanted organ is in their pelvis. So this this might change kind of what you're thinking about in relation to their to their pelvic pain. Um, additionally, they're not going to get this classic CVA tenderness if you're worried about an ascending urinary tract infection. Um, they can get you know pelvic and abdominal pain. Um, additionally, if you've got abdominal trauma, blunt trauma, um, or penetrating trauma, I guess for that matter. But if you've got abdominal trauma, it's just important to realize that that transplanted organ now lives in the anterior um, abdomen down in the pelvis. All of organ transplant patients are at an increased risk of coronary artery disease. This is a huge cause of death in these patients. And we're not just talking, you know, heart transplant patients. This is all organ transplant patients. So have a high index of suspicion for coronary artery disease, super low threshold to get an EKG in these patients. You know, they're not going to present maybe quite as classically, especially heart failure patients might not have classic chest pain. Um, so just knowing that these patients are already at a pretty, pretty significant risk of coronary artery disease. And then the last thing specifically with heart transplant patients, um, when they do this transplant, they um, no longer have autonomic innervation. So what does this mean? Um, number one, they usually have a baseline heart rate around 90. They're not getting the autonomic changes to heart rate. Um, you can get some re-innervation kind of long term with these patients. Um, but I think the most important thing is if you have bradycardia, um, especially unstable bradycardia in a heart transplant patient, atropine isn't going to help you. Um, so you can try it. Um, 
it's not going to hurt. Maybe they've reintervated and you'll get a little help, um, but you need to have a low threshold to, um, to pace these patients if they're truly unstable and bradycardic. So I think that's just kind of a unique thing to be aware of. So in summary, just kind of to recap kind of this kind of brief big overview of these patients. Number one, they exist out in our communities. We're doing more and more organ transplants, you know, in our community here in Columbus and just in general. Um, so these, and these patients are living longer with their transplants. So we need to know about this. Rejection is something that exists and is kind of a lifelong risk for these patients. Ask about it. Um, and if you're worried about it, kind of force yourself to think about these patients as if they're having organ failure of their transplanted organ and be worried about all the same things that you worry about in, in organ, um, you know, in renal failure patients with a kidney transplant or heart failure. Um, infection, think about it. Um, know that they're at increased risk. They might not present with all the same symptoms. One out of two people who have a pretty bad infection didn't have fever. Um, so just kind of know that it exists, have a low threshold to kind of be thinking about it. Um, these patients are on lifelong immunosuppressive medications, um, and these medications are not benign. So ask about medication changes, try to get an updated list. And then lastly, um, unstable or, you know, sick bradycardia and a heart transplant patient is going to need PACE a lot sooner than um, some of your other patients who might get a benefit of atropine. So thank you guys so much. If anybody has any questions, I'll get out of trying to share this. Dr. Andres, that was amazing. Solid work. Nice, quick rundown, concise on uh, transplant emergencies. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the panel right now. Uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Anders? Uh, Jeannie, I think you might be on mute. Crap. Of course. <laughs> I was that like all happens. through my, I was already through my question. There um, you go. Hey, it's Janine. Um, hey. <laughs> I was wondering, these patients are on a ton of different medications and immunosuppressives. And um, how about our pre-hospital providers giving pre-hospital medications like aspirin, um, for like acute coronary syndrome, are they okay with following their protocols from that perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think some of the, the big kind of mortality benefit medications like aspirin and coronary artery disease, um, is still indicated in these patients. I think if it's, you know, I think some of the other things, if you're like, who, sometimes we do this, but I'm not sure, honestly, in these patients, um, I would probably hold off. Um, obviously, if these are like, this is an acute emergent situation um, and you need, you know, life-saving mortality influencing um, medications, um, that's obviously indicated. Um, but I do think that just knowing that even benign medications in these patients can have um, significant interactions is important. The other thing is most of these interactions are going to be kind of long-term um, and they might affect the medication levels. So if you do give something, I think, you know, it's always important to make sure that's given in handoff, but I think even more so in these, um, in these cases, because it might be important to know that they received medication X, Y, and Z, which may influence, you know, some of these immunosuppressive medications they get levels on and things like that. Um, and so having that information to potentially allow, you know, long-term providers, even beyond the emergency department to interpret those levels um, or to kind of understand how those levels might fluctuate in the coming days um, is important. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Holly, I think you had texted a question as well. Do you do you want to do you want to ask that that question too? Because it's really good. Uh sure. Uh, not really nice presentation. Thank you for that. I was wondering if you could explain what the uh, uh, correlation and the link is with uh, with uh, cardiac disease and all organ transplant patients. Yeah. So a lot of the immunosuppressive medications. Um, cause some inflammatory changes. Um, and there's been some data that shows that these kind of chronic inflammatory 
um, disease patients. It's the same reason there's kind of some evolving evidence that patients like with lupus and kind of some other inflammatory um, disorders have increased coronary artery disease. So there, it's thought that this kind of prolonged and chronic inflammatory phase is influencing their coronary artery um, disease profile and their risk profile. Yeah, that's a great question because you don't always think about that as being a traditional coronary risk factor. So thanks for pointing that out, Holly. Uh, Dr. Anders, that was amazing. Again, thank you. Um, great presentation. Uh, and, and I'm sure that uh, if anybody would like that information, you know, we could get your presentation out. So just contact again, High Health EMS, and we can get you that information. Um, all right, so we'll transition now to Dr. Barr to talk about sickle cell emergencies. All right, like I'm on. Um, so I'm here to talk about sickle cell emergencies. Before I start my slides, uh, I apologize for the glare in the background. I've been trying to get rid of it, but the sun is moving. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to all the EMS providers for everything that you do. We're still in the middle of COVID, and it definitely hasn't gone away, although people think or may think it never existed. Um, thank you for, for doing what you do and, and staying out there um, and, and bringing us all these patients um, for everything. So let me get my presentation up. All right, so I'm here to talk about sickle cell disease today. I'm Laura Barra. I'm with uh, Moe's. Uh, I work mostly at Riverside and Grant. And so um, this is a very broad topic, and I really wanted to narrow it down to a couple points. Um, so if you know that sickle cell disease can cause infarction in almost any organ, so basically little micro deaths, uh, I think of MRIs or brain infarction. Um, it can happen anywhere. So if you're in doubt, if you see these patients are sick uh, and you transport them to us, you can get a lot of the information out of your usual assessment and all the treatments uh, you can start, well, most of the treatments you can start, oxygen, pain control, starting an LB, IV, uh, if they're in respiratory distress, give them LB well or bronchodilators. Um, and that is the start of everything you can do. Dr. Barr, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having a really hard time hearing you. Um, some of that introduction, it was just very hard to hear. So, can you hear me now? That's a lot better. Yes, I think you might need to stay that close. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll fix this one day. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just repeat that. So, um, a lot of the stuff that we do, uh, you can start give them oxygen, give them IV fluids. Um, check for infection, just assume that these patients are sick if you don't know, and bring them to us. So, sickle cell disease is an autosomal recessive disorder um, caused by a defect in the hemoglobin A globulin. So, what does that mean? It means that the normal red blood cells are these nice little circles that go easily through the capillary, whereas the sickle cells uh, cause a mutation that causes them to kind of bow into this sickle shape. And that causes them to cause blockages in the capillary, and it causes small infarcts wherever these clumping happen. Blood cannot get through, uh, and there's a feed. So, a couple things to know: it is autosomal recessive, meaning you need two copies of the defective gene uh, in order to have symptoms. If you only have one, you have sickle cell trait, and you can pass this on to your offspring, but you should not be symptomatic. It becomes more complicated because there's other defects you can have in this gene. So you can have hemoglobin SC disease, which is a different abnormal copy, uh, or hemoglobin S beta fail, uh, which will cause symptoms but generally not as severe. It is worth noting that in Ohio, as well as most states, we do screen for sickle cell disease on newborn screening before kids leave the hospital. And because fetal hemoglobin is still around until about four months to one year, these kids should not be symptomatic until parents have some idea that this might be a possibility. So you should be able to ask, do they have sickle cell? And at least get an idea if you need to worry about what's going on. So complications are numerous. As I said, uh, it can cause infarction in almost any area of your body. So I'm gonna concentrate on a few. Uh, 
Number one, bone pain is the most common site of uh, the sickle cell crisis or the sickle cell pain crisis. Acute chest syndrome is the number one cause of death. Um, numerous complications from bone infarcts, so avascular necrosis, osteomyelitis. We're going to talk about infection and specifically the spleen and ischemia. And we're going to end by talking about stroke because the big thing to know about stroke and sickle cell disease is that you don't treat it with TPA, you treat it with exchange transfusion. So you're not necessarily on the clock for the TPA, but you do need to get them uh, to where they have that capability, namely a tertiary care center uh, where they can uh, start that therapy. So first thing we're going to talk about is the sickle cell pain crisis. So this is going to be the most common thing you're going to see. It's ischemic pain in any organ, usually most often the bones, sometimes the abdomen. Um, and it's really frustrating to me and to other providers because you really have to suspend your clinical judgment um, because these are the patients that are complaining of 10 out of 15 or 15 out of 10 pain and they're texting on their phone and they're kind of ignoring what you're doing and doing activities. Uh, but they are in severe pain. It does require management often with opioids. Um, and, and you need to believe them when it happens. I want to go over a couple of the, couple of the causes because uh, they're things that we can start fixing. So if they pick them up outside in the cold, protein process, so get them in the truck, give them a blanket, dehydration, either oral or IV, IV fluids or oral rehydration can really help these patients. Um, hypoxia, giving them oxygen, that's infection, so being aware that not only are they more prone to infection, but it can cause a pain crisis. Um, other causes, pregnancy, altitude, stress, acidosis, alcohol, and sometimes we just don't know, so there can be a pain crisis in the um, We treat these with pain management, mild, maybe Tylenol, start an IV, give them opiates, bring them to us. A lot of them have um, a specific regimens because they have a higher density of opiate medication. Sometimes up to six is a lot of at a time, which makes it comfortable, um, but bring them to us where we know the care plan. Um, uh, if they can't breathe, give them bronchodilators, give them hydration, um, and then uh, uh, avoid transfusions is something that we need to worry about. So if they look like they're severely anemic, don't get up in person with them. Acute chest syndrome is something that you're going to see. It's the most common cause of death. So think of this as pneumonia in a sickle cell patient. So the signs of it are going to be fever, chest pain, shortness of breath, cough, wheezy. Um, happens mostly in a little kid age two to four, but it happens throughout the sickle cell life. Um, this is caused by both shunting, uh, because you're not oxygenating the lungs from the infarct, and as well as uh, uh, not breathing, because the ribs in a major or tubal column just makes it hard to breathe. Think of it as um, the, the trauma patients with broken ribs. You don't want to breathe because it hurts to breathe. Um, these, uh, these are the same way. So the treatment is if they're hypoxic, start oxygen. If they can't breathe, give them albuterol. Um, give them IV fluids, definitely. And then uh, get them to us where we can give antibiotics. And in severe cases, the chemical uh, exchange transfusion. Certainly, if they're in distress, go ahead and intubate them. Joint complications are common. Not only is it the most common site of the pain crisis, but they can also has, uh, have complications from infarct. So these people will uh, have avascular necrosis of the spleen of the head. Basically, they have ruptures, uh, not really fractures, but a death of the bone. Uh, they can be, have septic joints. They can have osteomyelitis. And what you can do to differentiate this is in the pain crisis, they should have a normal physical exam. Whereas if they say their hip hurts and they can't walk on the hip, it could be a vascular necrosis. If they say their knee hurts and it's red hot and swollen, be aware they can have an infection. Um, asplenia happens in most sickle cell patients. So basically by age five, they all have no spleen. Um, this makes them more prone to infection, specifically with a certain type of bacteria which is encapsulated. Um, so what type of bacteria are that? Salmonella and E. coli causes gastroenteritis. Uh, strep pneumo, H. flu, Klebsiella can cause both pneumonia and upper respiratory infections and ear infections. And then also meningitis, and it's very meningitis, they're more prone to. 
And because they don't have functioning immune systems, uh, they're more prone to sepsis and it can happen very quickly. A uh, good thing to know and to ask these patients is have they gotten their vaccinations? They should get vaccinated from these organisms every five years uh, and they might be able to tell you this. So these patients are already anemic, but they can have secondary causes of anemia, which can make it much worse and make them Specifically, aplastic crisis is when the bone marrow stops making red blood cells on top of their anemia. This can happen from a, a viral infection from Parvo B19, which classically causes a fever and a rash in kids. Um, it's the slap cheek rash, which is pictured below, as well as a diffuse uh, red rash on the body. Um, and then folate deficiency, which is common in alcoholics, uh, can cause this where they need a, a regular transfusion or a transplant. Um, hemolysis, which is where the red blood cells burst, can give them problems. And then before they uh, get rid of their spleen, it actually can act like a sponge and just soak up all the red blood cells in their body and cause them to have uh, anemia. And that hope happens most often before age five, because after that, they've infected their spleen. Last thing I'm going to talk about is stroke patients with sickle cell. Uh, and it's important to know that we don't give TPA in these patients. We treat them with a transplant fusion. So they can have both infarcts and hemorrhage. So when you lack the blood flow because all those sickle cells are blocking things, you hydrate them and you transfuse them to get more normal red blood cells, and then that helps the infarcts. Um, the infarcts happen more common in children. Hemorrhage happens more common in adults between age 20 to 30, but all, all siblings can have either complication. Um, if a kid does have a stroke, then oftentimes they're more prone to more strokes. Uh, so have a high index of suspicion, especially if they've said they've ever had that happen. So in summary, what can we do for these patients? A lot of the normal things that we do for regular patients. We give them assessments, screening for infections, say, do you have a fever, take their temperature. Um, get a pulse ox on them, assess for hypoxia, give them oxygen if they need to. Um, if they say one drink for it's more than normal, uh, take a look at it. If it's hot and red, that's probably not a normal pain crisis. And then definitely, definitely assess for stroke symptoms. Um, one of a, a really good question, if you have only one question to ask these patients is, is this your normal pain crisis? So if they say yes, they usually know their bodies pretty well. And that's usually what it is. But if they say, no, my chest hurts and I can't breathe, or no, my knee really hurts, um, that's a good indication to get them to us so we can figure it out. Um, treatment, a lot of the treatment we do, you can start. So oxygen, uh, albuterol, IV fluids, and heat management. That's us. Um, I hope you heard that because I somehow do not ever get my microphone to work. But, uh, any questions? Uh, Dr. Barr, that was a lot of really good information. Um, do we have any questions for Dr. Barr from the group? Laura, do you think from a pre-hospital perspective, uh, is there any, is there ever a time if we have somebody maybe in crisis or if we suspect one of those complications, should we just maybe plan on giving a liter of fluid to the adult patient? Is there a time when, when we shouldn't give fluids to a sickle cell patient in crisis? Is, is it ever a bad idea to do that? Um, so the answer is no, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> as if, with everything in medicine, yes. Uh, of course. If there is uh, any indication that they have acute chest syndrome or they have any complications from end organ damage or multi some organ failure, IV fluids are definitely the way to go. Uh, there is some controversy right now as far as pain crisis, whether or not IV fluids can make it worse. And basically, the jury is still out. So if you think they're in a pain crisis, definitely you're not wrong. Um, and But you're also not wrong if you want to tell them to take some Tylenol and drink some water and then maybe call back if it gets worse. Um, Definitely what you can do if you're going to transport, even if you don't want to start the fluid bag, start the IV because a lot of what we really want is time to pain management. So if you don't want to give anything, starting the IV makes it so that we already have that IV access on arrival. 
so we can look at their pain plan and give them appropriate communication. All right, thank you very much. Again, that was excellent. Uh, we all appreciate your time and expertise on that. Uh, we'll plan the transition now to pulmonary hypertension emergencies with Dr. Falp. I'll hand it over to you, doctor. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carlin Fulp. I work with um, Mid-Ohio Emergency Services. You may have seen me at Grant Medical Center, but I also work at Riverside and some of the freestandings. Um, I felt like this topic was really important to um, discuss just because a lot of our standard um, resuscitation practices from the field and EMS protocol um, can really uh, end up causing some harm to these patients. So maybe we can make a little bit of difference with that. So I'm gonna work on sharing my screen here. All right, and hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, so getting into this pulmonary hypertension, it's a rare disease process and even um, standard we have a difficult time diagnosing it. Um, believe it or not, uh, it can take up to two years on average to diagnose patients with pulmonary hypertension. Um, what I wanna focus today on is on decompensated patients um, because again, that's where EMS is gonna make the most difference. So you guys out there. Um, and I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, so let's get into it. Um, so what exactly is pulmonary hypertension? So. Um, I want you to think of hoses as we go throughout this. So think of your fire hose, think of your garden hose, and that's gonna give you a good framework to work with. Um, so normally the pulmonary vasculature is a high flow, low resistance system. That means we are getting a lot of blood through really fast and we're doing it without getting a lot of pushback. And that's gonna be important for our oxygen exchange. Um, for the technical definition of pulmonary hypertension, it's defined as a mean arterial um, pulmonary pressure that's greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. So contextually, when you're feeling for pulses on a patient, um, let's say if your systolic blood pressure was 25 millimeters of mercury, you would not feel that. The patient would be dead. So again, this is a very low pressure system, or should be. Um, typically to diagnose this, it's going to be diagnosed by a right heart cath. Um, you can estimate it with echocardiogram, and even sometimes I'll see uh, radiologists will say on a CT scan that they can see findings consistent with it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the structural changes. So really the pathophysiology, believe it or not, most of it's unknown, but it's believed to be the balance of um, the homeostasis of this system is off. So when you're talking about um, chemicals that are either going to vasodilate or vasoconstrict, um, those are the things that are in error. Um, this can result in serious consequences of clots, structural changes, and ultimately, if you have these big pressures for long periods of time, it's going to impact your flow um, to the pulmonary system. Uh, so this is a really nice picture that kind of shows the normal um, state of the heart on the left side, again, that low pressure, high flow system, and the pathologic over here on the right. And so I'm gonna talk about the poor little right ventricle that no one ever talks about who gets no respect ever. Um, this right ventricle needs to, in this kind of system, when you have all this resistance pushing back on it, to compensate and to get blood flow through, it ends up becoming dilated. And what this can lead to is a consequence of this right coronary artery, which perfuses that right ventricle. Normally, um, it gets perfused in both diastole and systole. Um, and when it's impaired, um, you only get it during diastole. This leads to that ventricular output impairment, meaning that that right ventricle can't pump as well. And this, unfortunately, can lead to cardiac collapse. So this is a nice diagram that kind of shows the, the spiral of the RV dysfunction. So kind of starting here at the asterisk, you can see how it talks about the structural changes of the right ventricle, which increases the tension. And like we talked about that poor little right coronary artery not getting as much blood flow, which leads to ischemia. Again, not enough blood flow to the cardiac muscle, which leads to decreased right ventricle output. And that leads to overload of the right ventricle. You can see how it also feeds into two other cycles. So over the green, um, this right ventric um, ventricle being abnormal can uh, cause that stretching out, which as you remember, the tricuspid 
valve is on that side. So you may even hear a murmur on these patients and that leads to, um, again, the decreased rate of ventricular output, which again, kind of causes a state of overload. And then looking over on this other side, you can see how um, the pathologic changes of the right ventricle can lead to impacting the left ventricle, which we're much more familiar with. And that decreased cardiac output in that traditional kind of presentation of heart failure, um, which again, feeds into not getting enough systemic circulation, which again, <laughs> leads to the poor right ventricle suffering even more. And it just feeds into a vicious, vicious loop. So for a more chronic um, pulmonary hypertension, uh, you may see nonspecific signs of shortness of breath, chest pain, fatigue. Um, patients may complain of syncope, near syncope, exertional lightheadedness. Um, so sometimes you'll just get the general complaint of weakness. And these are going to be more for your chronic pulmonary hypertension. Um, the World Health, World Health Organization actually divides it into five main categories. Um, but to kind of, we're not going to focus too much on those because, again, um, treatment of your chronic pulmonary hypertension is going to be treatment of whatever the underlying pathology is. Um, so they can be heritable, they can be connective tissue disorders like scleroderma. Um, believe it or not, HIV, schistomoniasis, those can kind of feed into it. Um, a lot of times they can be heritable, like congenital heart disorders. Um, most commonly, though, you're going to see um, COPD and left-sided heart, left heart disease. And those are going to be maybe the ones that you might recognize a little bit more. And of course, um, pulmonary uh, embolism can lead to um, acute uh, pulmonary hypertension. So, so that's something to also be aware of. Um, but later on, when again, what we're focusing on more today is those heart failure symptoms, so JVD, edema, rails, those sorts of things. So how do you know? Um, maybe the patient um, says like, hey, here's my medication list. Um, so the most common drug classes that these patients are gonna be on um, include calcium channel blockers, um, endothelial receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase, five inhibitors, and profanoids. A lot of these are going to be vasodilators. So again, trying to help um, decrease that resistance, allow for more blood flow to go through. Um, but you may notice like amlodipine. Um, if you see that on the list, it's not necessarily a guarantee because amlodipine is used for just regular hypertension. Um, but again, maybe if you see multiple of these medications, or especially if they're on an infusion, um, that may give you a little bit more hint as that they have underlying pulmonary hypertension. Um, again, this is something typically we see a lot of um, heart failure patients, but um, if this is something where they're breathing and they're having a lot of trouble, this may be a consideration for you to, you know, ask like, hey, do you also have pulmonary hypertension um, and part of getting that history in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, we won't dive completely into EKG findings, but for your for your EKG gurus out there, um, these are some things that you can review, um, but hopefully they just tell you that they have pulmonary hypertension. Um, so the main points of resuscitation for these acutely decompensated ones, we're gonna talk about first, what if they're hypotensive? Our, most of our protocols for when they have low blood pressures is give fluids, um, but unfortunately big fluids, um, lots of fluids all at once can really harm these patients. If you remember that chart that we talked about, how it kind of feeds into that vicious cycle um, of RV dis dysfunction, if you're overloading that right ventricle, it can make things a lot worse. Um, so I would say consider a small bolus of either 250, maybe 500 cc's, quickly give that in and just see if the patient responds. Um, the reason for that is if you give too much fluid and you make it worse, they're gonna spiral and it's gonna be bad. Um, but a lot of times they're same things that can affect all your other patients like sepsis. Um, they can get dehydrated too. Um, so it's hard in the pre-hospital setting to always try to decide, but if you give a small bolus of 250 cc's, they respond to that, great, solid. If they don't, then you're not making it worse, you're not harming them more. Um, for vasopressors, these are gonna be kind of your friend. In the hospital, we have the luxury of having um, dobutamine along with another vasopressor, melrinone. Those are typically your first line agents. However, um, you guys out in the field may not necessarily have room for those. Um, this is where your push dose epi may be beneficial. Um, and again, I would talk to your medical director about what me medications you have available. Um, but certainly you have to be cautious with push dose epi because these can lead to tachydysrhythmias and that can cause even more problems. So this just gives you a little summary of commonly used vasoactive medications. But again, if you look in the commonalities of dobutamine and milrinone, um, you can see how it kind of helps with the pump function and 
um, the heart rate function. Um, again, you have to be careful with your systemic vascular resistance and um, peripheral vascular resistance, and a lot of these medications um, can cross over and have effects on these. The second most important thing is your airway management. These are patients that do not tolerate oxygen um, desaturations, hypoxemia, and can really worsen because um, again, it feeds back to that vasoconstriction and um, pulmonary artery resistance. And again, that vicious cycle, that spiraling death. Um, so always try nasal cannula and non rebreathers first. Um, and if those aren't sufficient, you still have resources there. You, you don't have to just give up. Um, you can use CPAP as well. Um, but again, you want to use the lowest possible PEEP. Um, because if you're using higher PEEP, that can lead to, again, an increase in the pulmonary artery pressure, which, again, as we talked about, that vicious cycle. Um, if you have to intubate these patients, which sometimes you do, um, so really with severe pulmonary hypertension, these are unfortunately really, really sick patients if you end up seeing them. So um, just be aware that, in addition, um, intubating can be difficult, one, because of the PEEP, but two, your agents that you may be using for a rapid sequence intubation. Um, so a lot of these can cause hypotension and worsen the cardiac function. And again, that poor little right coronary ar artery, I'm gonna keep advocating for them. Um, when these abnormal uh, states where that right ventricle is really dilated and the right coronary artery is only getting perfused during diastole, if you lower the systemic blood pressure, that means that diastolic pressure is even lower and that poor little guy is just not getting fed. Either way, you, if you're going to have to intubate, you still need to pre-oxygenate. So that can be your non-rebreather. You can even use CPAP, but again, keep that PEEP as low as possible. Um, recommend, and again, talk to your medical directors, um, but you can consider atomidate and ketamine as choices. Those are going to be the ones that are going to be least labile with the blood pressure, but you may want to consider an awake approach to intubation, um, which can always be scary, but again, what you're trying to do what's best for the patient. Um, so let's say you get them to that point where um, you either have them intubated or you have them on BiPAP. Remember, hypercapnia is just as bad as hypoxemia in these patients. So I would encourage a higher respiratory rate. So consider starting at 16 breaths per minute, 18 breaths per minute. And again, that low PEEP because we do not want to increase that um, pulmonary artery pressure. And the most important thing, again, you know, you have to make that call. If they're really sick and they need someone, you bring them to wherever they can, but ideally, if you can get them to a hospital where they get their care with a pulmonary hypertension specialist, that's going to be the best thing you can do for them. All right. And I just want to say thank you again for everything that you guys do. I know it's not been easy with COVID, and I'm sorry that I'm not able to bribe you with ice cream and pizza today. Um, these are my citations, and I really appreciate your attention and participation. So um, we will take any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Fulp. That was excellent. Uh, a nice quick summary on pulmonary hypertension emergencies. For the panel, do we have any questions for Dr. Fulp? So <clears throat> what about physiologic PEEP? <clears throat> Is that a disadvantage or an advantage in these patients to do five of PEEP? Five of PEEP may be what you need because, again, you're trying to help them. So it depends on what their cause of why they're acutely decompensating. So, for example, if they're retaining carbon dioxide, that can be beneficial. But if you put too much pressure in, it increases all of that pressure um, intrathoracically and around that. So um, using five of PEEP if you have to, but I would really err on the side of caution not to go any higher than that because, again, you can do that spiral of death and you can very quickly kill these patients. That was a good question, Holly. I appreciate that. All right. If there's no further questions for Dr. Fulp, um, I want to thank you. That was excellent again. Uh, and we'll get ready to transition to our next topic with Dr. Casey. You know, as a quick summary so far, we had our trauma case where we had a very complicated multi-system trauma. Uh, and we talked about some of the challenges with that and balancing the different types of resuscitation. Uh, 
And then for the past several presentations, we've, we've really focused in on patients that we're probably going to see very infrequently, but they're very high risk patients. They typically present in atypical fashions. We have to adjust our assessments and sometimes our treatments for those patients. We're going to transition. Our last two topics are still unique patient populations, but we're going to see the next two topics a lot more frequently. Uh, so they're both high frequency and high risk. Uh, so very important to, to be aware of some of the emergencies that occur in alcoholic patients as well as pediatric anaphylaxis. So uh, with that being said, in that transition, we'll hand it over to Dr. Casey to talk about emergencies in alcoholic patients. Thanks, John. Thanks, Eric. Um, let's see. Let's make sure I get this up for you. Okay. You able to see that okay there? Yes, that's perfect. All right. Very good. Uh, I don't really know what Dr. Cortez is talking about. I really have a hard time finding alcoholic patients, um, particularly during COVID, uh, which is, was the inspiration for the title of this presentation. Um, because I have a lot of friends that have had some empty bottles. I'm not really worried about them because they had good reasons. Um, but uh, alcohol emergencies is unfortunately quite a common thing. I'm John Casey. I am the residency director, uh, which is the uh, branch of emergency medicine that teaches uh, physicians after they graduate from medical school to specialize in emergency medicine and interact with all of you amazing EMS providers. Um, so we work hand in hand with the EMS fellowship and uh, with Dr. Cortez and the entire Ohio Health EMS team. So I'd like to thank him for having me out. Also, I'm the EMS medical director for a few agencies over uh, near Doctors Hospital. So shout out to all of my uh, paramedics and EMS providers with those agencies. With that being said, let's uh, get started on this. So first of all, just to let everybody know, I don't have any disclosures. I don't have any secret wineries or uh, investments in uh, skull vodka or anything like that. And the goal is going to be really straightforward. I wanted to review the basic and ALS considerations for some suspected alcohol emergencies. And I really wanted to put emphasis on the suspected part of that because not all alcoholic emergencies are exactly what you think. So I'm going to attack uh, just a couple of things from different angles and maybe give you a different perspective on it. And then we'll take some questions at the end. And you guys are always welcome to reach out to me with any questions you have, as Dr. Cortez had previously mentioned. So let's start off with uh, Kermit the Frog here as a great opening. So intoxication uh, is one of those things that often presents in, with some type of medical quandary. And the question really here is, is Kermit uh, able to refuse care? And so I get this question a lot uh, from EMS providers that uh, at all levels that are trying to manage patients, and that is, what do we talk about with patients uh, and the capacity for them to make medical decisions? And honestly, people can be intoxicated, but still have the mental capacity to make decisions about their health care. So your job as a pre-hospital professional is to make sure you do no harm. And the way to do that is this, look at the totality of the patient circumstances. Look at what they're doing, what the plan is, and what's reasonable for them. And think about what uh, a reasonable person in those circumstances would do. So somebody that's had one or two glasses of wine uh, with dinner, it's been an hour or two later, they tell you that they've had that. Uh, they um, stumble going up the stairs back into their house because the lamp was burned out. And you get there and they've got a scratch on their knee and they're able to walk. Um, a bystander just called 911, though, because it saw them going by, and they were forthcoming about the alcohol use. Um, that's somebody that if you talk to them, they're able to orient themselves appropriately. The alcohol is just kind of incidental to what happened. We like to all think that that's what made them stumble up the stairs, but sometimes people just fall down. Gravity hurts. So keep that in mind. Always think about it. And remember, we do a lot of protocolized standing order medicine here uh, in this area and in Ohio in general. But you always have the option to call for backup. And us CMS medical directors, we actually love it when you call uh, and give us some information and, and seek some advice. So if you have a question about that, remember um, to reach out a hand and we will help you. Um, next up, I wanted to hit on one of my favorite topics, which is hypothermia and alcoholics. And uh, quick shout out to all the hypothermics out there. 
Um, it's a, it's a nice warm day here actually. Um, so you have to work pretty hard to, uh, lose your body temperature, but that's actually really a joke because you really don't. So even when it's 60 degrees outside, 70 degrees outside, if you've been laying out all night, I assure you it wasn't actually that warm overnight. And when you distribute your body mass over concrete or something like that, it's very easy for you to lose heat into that. It becomes a heat sink. And if you've added alcohol where you have a person who doesn't uh, reposition themselves often or realize that they are losing their body temperature, it's very easy for them to become hypothermic. And one of the problems with this is um, that oftentimes these patients are not the most amazing to take care of. And I know you're all compassionate providers, but we all have bad days where we're a little bit jaded. And so you're taking care of this patient who is covered in urine or maybe vomit or feces. Um, they, they've got all these stinky clothes on them. Uh, they haven't bathed in a while. They're not the most pleasant patient. And you, you just really want to just get them in the rig and get them to the hospital and kind of get them off your plate. I, I really encourage you to take the time uh, to check their, their temperature. You'd be surprised how many of these patients uh, present to the emergency department. And then we find that they're really hypothermic and not just a little hypothermic, like 91, 92 degrees. And all of that slurred speech and everything that you were attributing to their alcohol intake was actually being caused by hypothermia. So I really implore you to take the time to check that vital sign. If you don't um, have a thermometer on your unit, a great uh, technique, and it's really simple, is just use your gloved hand. Be careful, lift up their clothing, put your hand on the core of their belly. If the, if the front of the abdomen is feeling really cold, that's a great surrogate marker for core temperature. And it can just give you some idea that something else may be going on. So quick little trip there for uh, BLS or ALS providers to use. Uh, next up, just keep in mind, alcoholics uh, get sicker at a higher rate than the rest of society. Uh, the elderly are particularly at risk, but so are alcoholics. And we oftentimes forget about that. And so what that means is when you're called to take care of an alcoholic patient, you should absolutely err on the side of transporting that patient. I know it's frustrating. I know we give them frequent flyer cards. I know the hospital groans sometimes when they see the same patient coming back in and it feels like a revolving door. But just remember that the person you're taking care of is somebody's brother, mother, father, sister, aunt, somebody somewhere cares about that human. And at the moment, it should be you. And try and keep in mind that those patients often have complaints. They've often been in and out of the ER, and they'll often be resistant to telling you what's really going on. Many times when we strip these patients down, we find decubitus ulcers or ulcerations on their feet where they've been walking around. Um, we find uh, all kinds of uh, sores and open wounds that they're just not forthcoming about. So please keep that in mind. Uh, and err on the side of doing more rather than doing less. You never know when this may be the time that they actually may have exactly what they need to turn things around. Real quick, beer, coincidentally, but if you don't have access to that or don't drink, uh, delirium tremens is still something you should know about, uh, and they've known about it for a long time. This is a cover from an old magazine in Paris that described the uh, effects of alcohol uh, shattering a family. And basically, if you can just remember what this guy in the bed looks like, that is true delirium tremens. So DTs are caused by uh, the inability of the GABA receptors um, to get what they need and then upregulation of glutamate. You don't have to remember that. Just remember the things that calm you down aren't there and the things that work you up are. And it all has to do with the fact of uh, fairly long-term alcohol use because their person's biochemistry has changed. So the key marker of delirium tremens is that the person is agitated. Um, so we'll talk in a minute about what we can do to settle them down a little bit, but just keep that in mind. Uh, the important thing is any alcoholic patient that you run on or you suspect alcohol use, whether they think it's a big deal or not, ask them if they've ever suffered alcohol withdrawal or if they um, have ever suffered DTs. And if they have, you should err on the side of transporting them. And if they absolutely still have capacity and refuse to be transported. This is the one group of patients, if they've had alcohol uh, withdrawal, that you should actually encourage them to continue drinking and seek help uh, at another facility um, when they're ready. Um, because if they stop drinking alcohol, uh, they can have many, many bad things happen to them. Two more slides in my brief run around of alcohol. And this is one of my favorites because it helps remind me of how exactly did that person get to the ground? 
or in this case, get the Santa hat on. I'm suspecting this was a chimney related injury induced with alcohol at Christmas time. Uh, and on the right side of your screen, uh, I'm suspecting, uh, you know, this fellow was not just laying on the grass enjoying the day. So think about trauma. Uh, think about other considerations. I make it a point to pretty much always try and be a bedside and I encourage my residents to do the same thing when you give EMS reports, because the reports you give are so, so important. It's so easy for little details to get lost. So I had an example uh, recently where a crew came in and they told me that a fellow was found down in his bathroom, um, but they were surprised because even though he looks really drunk, there was no alcohol to be found in the house, no empty bottles or anything like that. And uh, when I asked them what they did have in there, they said, well, there were some empty rubbing alcohol bottles um, that were in the trash can, but that was it. And it turns out that it was indeed not an ethyl alcohol overdose, but an isopropyl alcohol overdose. And that's really critical information because it changes um, how I'm going to treat the patient. And because of that information, we were able to initiate treatment way more quickly than if we had waited for what we call a volatile panel to come back. So uh, super important information. And basically, those medics not only saved the life by transporting the patient, but also by giving me that quick information. And last slide, so I don't run too long. Just wanted to talk about this. I know it's not exactly pre-hospital, but um, I often get questions from curious pre-hospital providers that want to know a little bit more about what's going on. And uh, one of the new in vogue things that used to be in vogue anyway was phenobarbital. You may hear more and more places talking about putting people on phenobarbital as opposed to benzodiazepines. Now, I know many of you have access to benzodiazepines like Ativan, and you're more comfortable with that. And those drugs actually work well for calming down DTs and agitation with alcohol. But interestingly enough, phenobarbital, which was around for a much longer time, has a much wider safety index. And the pharmacokinetics for all of you ALS providers works differently. Ativan is a summative effect. You kind of have to keep giving it to maintain a level in their system that will keep them just calm enough to be calm, but not so calm that they stop breathing. Phenobarbital works differently, and it's a cumulative effect. Every time you give an additional dose, you're working to get them into what we call a therapeutic range. So it's very hard on an initial dose, uh, given it the right amount, to cause any problems uh, with a patient that can't be fixed later. So uh, I suspect this may be coming back around, and you may eventually see this in pre-hospital protocols, just because that's pretty much what we do with everything in medicine. Uh, I'm voting for Mass Trousers 2020. Uh, to make a comeback. But anyway, uh, thank you all so very much for taking the time. Thanks for all you do. You're amazing people. Um, and I will take any questions anyone may have. Let me stop sharing this here screen. Thanks. Thanks, John. That was excellent. Up to the point where you mentioned mass trousers, then you kind of lost me and stuff. But Well, you know, I'm in as a stabilizing device, really. <laughs> they're, they're a great air splint if you have suspected <laughs> fractures everywhere. It's just, you know, you got to bring it back around again. Understood. Makes sense. Janine, I think you have a question. Is that correct? I do. Hey, Dr. Casey, how are you doing today? I'm great. Hey, Janine. Uh, thanks so much for that lecture. I was wondering if you could hit on the use of restraints, uh, physical versus chemical restraints. I know this is a high risk patient population and that's a lot of pretty controversial um, at this time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so the the first guiding principle for pretty much all of EMS, quite honestly, is you've got to maintain your own safety. And for example, BLS crews don't have the pharmacologic options that other other folks have. So um, if ideally, it, my order of preference is um, voluntary relaxation, which means we talk you down and you settle down yourself, followed by uh, chemical. Uh, relaxation using um, benzos or phenobarbital, depending on if I'm in the pre-hospital environment or have access to a full pharmacy. Um, and then the next level down is uh, yeah, um, chemical plus uh, physical restraint, meaning I just restrain them until things kick in. And then physical restraint uh, is the is the last best uh, vestige of what to do. I think the key things are if you're a BLS provider and you don't have any other option, you've tried to talk them down and you're being you're being threatened. Um, try and restrain them uh, minimally. In other words, you know, one person on each limb, so it's easier to control if you have enough people there to do that. Uh, also, just be very cautious about things that cause airway or breathing impaction. I think that's the main thing. Um, it, don't restrain them face down. Don't restrain them in such a way that you can't 
see their airway and if they start to vomit, address it and don't do anything that will restrict their chest um, or basically push on their belly. Um, I think if you do those things and avoid things like choke holds and things like that, um, which are all again, airway uh, compromisers, um, then uh, you would be doing the very best thing you could do for a really complicated and challenging patient. Great question. Great, thank you. Yeah, and honestly, one quick plug for training. Um, I think that is probably one of the most important things that uh, teams don't necessarily train on all the time. And so if you're looking, you know, in a non-COVID era for some good training to do, practice restraining people using the EMS crew that you have. Uh, it's not as easy as it looks. It's it's not easy even when the person isn't really trying to hurt you. Um, so it's a good thing to practice to figure out how you would approach those patients as a team. That's a great point, Dr. Casey. Similar to how we choreograph our cardiac arrest, these are high risk situations um, that you should practice and choreograph. So that's a great point. Yep. All right. Well, I see Dr. Dietrich's on. So we're going to move on to our next topic. Thanks, John. Um, we'll be talking about pediatric anaphylaxis. Thank you, Ann. Hello. I'm going to vote with, well, first, I've got to find my slides. So I'm going to vote with Dr. Casey that we should bring back the mass trousers. Just because I, I have to say, the older you get, the more things cycle back around. And you're like, didn't we say no to that a while ago? Anyways, um, although currently I can't think of any use for them other than splints. So um, welcome, everybody. I appreciate everything that you do. And I am here to talk about pediatric anaphylaxis and kind of what's the state of affairs currently for us. So um, going along with the humor that everyone has, um, I just wanted to remind everybody, are you allergic to anything? I mean, aside from whatever it was that bit you, and you can clearly see the urticarial reaction. So for this brief session, we're gonna kind of stick to the basics because honestly, for anaphylaxis, it's common, it's life-threatening, and you need to know what you're looking for and you need to treat them quickly. So we'll go through the definition, which I think has really changed um, and there's some key facts that I think we just need to discuss. We're going to talk about what triggers these things, things you should ask people about for possible exposures. We're going to talk about the clinical presentation because I think that's what you're faced with the most commonly is, you know, is this an anaphylactic reaction or isn't it? Um, treatment is critical um, and there's some very um, important steps that you need to take. And then um, I'm going to briefly touch on follow up care and management. Um, because I do think it's important um, because most of us are going to be exposed to anaphylaxis, not only in our practices, but, you know, with other families or maybe even with your own children. So, first of all, anaphylaxis is a rapid onset allergic reaction. If any of you have ever seen it, and I bet a whole bunch of you have, because it's been increasing. We see more and more allergic reactions um, as time goes on. And you can see from the numbers over the last few years, they've just been increasing. And we're seeing more and more anaphylactic reactions. The problem we have is that there's still a lot of times these kids have anaphylactic reactions and the attention isn't paid or the correct attention isn't paid to how much of an emergency this is. Um, for instance, um, we had a um, situation where we had a child that was at a school that was having respiratory emergency um, after exposure to something and the school nurse called the mom and the mom came and then the mom and the nurse got in the car together with the child and went to the urgent care and by that point in time, the child respiratory arrested in the lobby. Now, they were very fortunate that this child was um, able to be resuscitated by the ED physician that was working in the urgent care um, to the point of intubation. But the child walked out two days later from children's um, perfectly fine. So this is something you have to recognize and you have to aggressively manage when you recognize it. Now, the definition of anaphylaxis, I think one of the things that's kind of happened is that there's been a lot of, um, I don't want to say overreaction, but parents get very concerned when they hear anaphylaxis. So you as a healthcare provider, a provider of care in acute situations, need to know when it's appropriate to diagnose the anaphylaxis and when maybe you aren't dealing with anaphylaxis. So this was a 2005 joint task force 
on practice parameters, and they define it as a condition caused by, um, usually it's an IGE mediated, and all you need to know about IGE is that it's fast and it's mean. So it's an aggressive, life-threatening, um, and usually it's unanticipated um, by the family. In 2010, the National Institute of Allergy, Immunology, and Infectious Disease um, published this guideline for managing allergy. And I think it's important that you recognize that when they did their definition, um, they combined, you had to have two things that were going on at the same time. So you don't have usually just um, a bee sting with itching around the site. You usually will have a skin reaction, something like hives, angioedema. And in addition, you have a uh, systemic effect. So you will have hives and respiratory symptoms, or you can have angioedema um, with hypotension. Um, and so when they did their definition, you needed to have two things. So the child that gets diarrhea after drinking milk is not anaphylaxis. The child that gets a bee sting and it itches, that's not anaphylaxis. Um, what you need to have to make the diagnosis of anaphylaxis is two systems affected, which can be hives or angioedema, respiratory symptoms, hypotension, and GI symptoms. Um, and so those are really important things to take in mind as you're presented with a patient that you're evaluating for anaphylaxis. Now, what can be triggers for anaphylaxis? Now, this is something that's really important. In the United States, shell food is the most common food allergy if you're over five years of age. But if you're under five years of age, it's gonna be eggs, fruits, peanuts, and tree nuts are gonna be the most common triggers. So if you have someone who's suddenly having um, hives and wheezing, respiratory symptoms. These are the kind of things you want to ask. Have you been exposed to any of these things? What were they doing right before their exposure? Um, did they eat a new cookie? And then has the teacher looked at the cookie label to see what the exposure is? You can also see it from insect stings. Um, medications are going to be most commonly antibiotics are going to be the ones that can be a uh, trigger for anaphylaxis. Now, routes of exposure can be variable. Um, so the one thing to think about is our kids that have latex allergies, they can even be triggered just from a skin exposure um, or touching something. Um, my oldest son um, anaphylaxis to tree nuts, and he can actually be triggered just by getting the, um, like if someone stirs up a bowl of almonds, like the dust from it can actually make him start. Um, you can also have things from stingers like bee stings um, that can trigger an anaphylactic reaction. Um, or you can have ingestion or inhalation. And those are all different routes um, that a, pat a patient can be potentially exposed. So here's my, my next one second humor. These are the bees preparing for the murder hornets. If you will notice, they're getting the Jack Daniels, which Dr. Casey informed us about, but they're also getting their toilet paper and their hand sanitizer. So what starts anaphylaxis? So what happens is you get an exposure you get antibodies and then it triggers with the IgE and the IgE triggers release of vasoactive mediators that act on the vascular and pulmonary system. So that should reinforce to you what two systems did I tell you are gonna be most likely involved? Skin, respiratory, and then the hemodynamics. So you're gonna get somebody who's gonna have the hives and the respiratory symptoms. It can cause pruritus, um, edema and urticaria, which is the most common things that we'll see. And if you get a vast quantity of that release, you can go into hypotension, um, respiratory failure, um, both systems collapsing. How do you recognize anaphylaxis? When you get there, it's usually going to be somebody that says, um, my, my um, son that has the anaphylaxis, he will tell you when he eats something, he can tell he gets a zinc metal taste in his mouth and his lips start to swell and he starts to itch then he starts to have difficulty breathing. And usually it's fast onset. It's within five to 10 minutes of exposure. Um, you can also see some flushing or urticaria and you're very fortunate. Like if you ask him, he'll tell you, yes, I've anaphylaxed, he's older now. So he'll tell you, I, I, I've got an EpiPen, I, I'm highly allergic to tree nuts and shellfish um, and this is gonna be my trigger. But sometimes you're the first person. And so especially for our younger kids, and the parents who have younger children, they may not know what the child was exposed to. So priorities on the child, but if you can get or have the parents start to write down what the child was exposed to immediately before, that can be very helpful down the road. 
This was from a study and I thought it was very interesting. So it compares all ages is the first column and then children are gonna be in the second column. And the interesting thing for kids is that most of the symptoms that they experience, if you look at are urticaria and wheezing. So that's gonna be our highest frequently um, noted symptoms are going to be um, angioedema, urticaria, um, wheezing and difficulty breathing. Critical, how do we treat it? And this is the one piece of literature um, that has been reinforced and reinforced and reinforced, is that I am epi given to the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh is the life-saving medication. Um, epinephrine is first-line treatment. All of the studies, what, whatever method you look at the study data has shown that by getting this on board as quickly as possible, you can stop the reaction or at least curtail the reaction so it doesn't progress. So if you have the ability to get that epinephrine in there fast, you can stop it and give yourself time for the body to regroup a little bit. If you don't, everything starts to progress. And what happens when we end up in that terrible cycle? We can't stop it. So if the longer we wait to give that medication, the more likely we are to have um, not only bad outcomes, but delay in epinephrine delivery was associated with a higher risk of fatal anaphylaxis. So it's important if you get there and you've got a child that was exposed to something recently, who now has hives, angioedema, you listen to them, you can hear wheezing, we need to get that IM epi on board as fast as possible. And that's going to help stop the rest of the reaction and give you a chance um, for that child physiologically to make a little bit of um, recovery. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, in a large series of fatal cases, only 21 of 92 patients got their epinephrine before cardiac arrest. And every year we lose children from allergic reactions. A friend of mine lost um, his daughter to an allergic reaction. It's really important that we, number one, recognize it, and number two, very quickly move on to the epinephrine um, to try and stop it from progressing. Here's just a quick refresher um, on the dose for anaphylaxis. You can give it by auto injector or syringe. If IM doesn't work, and um, one of my friends was the one who resuscitated the child that came from the school with the mom and the nurse, um, and he actually gave the IM, but because he was in respiratory arrest, he pushed the IV. And honest to goodness, uh, he saved the kid's life. Kid walked out in two days. Um, but it's really important that you, if you can't get the IM in, or if they're not responding to the IM, go ahead and give them IV. There's been a lot of discussion about the auto injectors. You know, the 0.3 devices are for greater than 25 kilos, the 0.15 are for under 25. And then, you know, the kids that are under 10 kilos, um, should you run the risk of giving them um, too high of a dose? Most people in pediatrics believe that the benefits outweigh the risks if you think you've got a true anaphylactic reaction going on. The good news for us is that almost all of our kids that are in this situation have normal healthy hearts and one epidose is not going to push any of them over the edge. So if you have a situation and you're not sure and the kid is under 10 kilos, it is going to be better to give them the IM epidose than it is to wait on it. And if you, all you have is the auto injector that has a set dose, go ahead and give it. Um, you know, I think that the risk is going to be much less um, than the benefit potential in a child that's truly anaphylaxing. I just wanted to mention other medications. Um, you know, it's really hard sometimes. The diversity of allergic reactions and anaphylaxis that we see makes studies very, very difficult to do, especially in children. But there is, I have to point out, a lack of evidence for steroids and antihistamines helping in an anaphylactic situation. Um, however, the national consensus guidelines, and these are from allergists um, and specialists who deal with these type of situation, recommends that we give these in the emergency department setting. Um, personally, if the kids had any respiratory difficulty, we all know how well glucocorticoids work, um, steroids work for asthma. I think that a child who's been wheezing should absolutely get the steroids, and that's supported by the national consensus guidelines. So if you have a um, child that has an anaphylactic reaction, I am epi, then you go with the glucocorticoid 
glucocorticoids. The only problem, as everybody warns you, is they take a little bit of time to work. So epi is the emergent drug that has to get in there. Glucocorticoids aren't going to work for a while. So they, some people will say they take up to two to three hours to start to kick in. So you give them so that you can stop um, any ongoing release of the allergens in the system. It's not going to work within those first couple of minutes. What about H1 blockers? Um, they don't impact the underlying physiology of anaphylaxis, and they should never, ever, ever serve as a substitute for epinephrine. But they really do help if you've got hives. Um, they improve comfort, um, especially if you've got um, urticaria, hives, angioedema, and can help things. H2 blockers um, have also been shown to work for urticaria, but there is not really any good data for anaphylaxis. So I would consider epi the magic drug, um, if the child patient, if the child has urticaria and hives, H1 blockers and H2 blockers are going to make perfect sense um, as treatment for those types of symptoms, and steroids make complete sense as a mitigator for the um, allergic reaction. You probably have heard um, when you take these kids in and they've had a true anaphylactic reaction, you will watch. Um, Physicians are very cautious, and there's good reason where we're cautious. What we're worried about is the biphasic reaction. They used to talk about, oh, you know, the drug wears off and this. No, what happens is the kid's been exposed to an allergen. And if you think about it, say they ate tree nuts. So they ate the tree nuts, they swallowed it, they didn't throw up. What happens when you get that anaphylactic reaction is your stomach sometimes doesn't work. So what happens is that I am epi kicks in and everything. You get a second release with them being um, absorbed by the stomach into the system, and you can see a second allergic reaction, and that's what's called a biphasic reaction, and that's why we're very, very, very careful to watch the kids. Most people would recommend that they get watched for 6 to 8 to 12 hours. If they truly have had hives, um, angioedema, tongue edema, wheezing, and strider, a lot of people will keep them 12 to 24 just to be absolutely sure um, that the allergic reaction has been curtailed. Now, the one other thing I'm going to say is one of my personal things, because my son has the problem, is, um, and they don't talk about it much, is one of the things you can do pre-hospital to help the child, epi-im is first. But if the child stuck their hand into something with latex, wash their hand. My son's instructed that if he gets something in his mouth and he gets that zinc taste, he immediately goes, rinses his mouth out three or four times, scrubs around his face, scrubs his hands, scrubs the top to make sure there's no ongoing exposures. Um, and that's really important. Um, we had one patient at Children's um, a few years ago that actually got exposed to a bubble bath that had some kind of oil in it that they were allergic to. And they could not stop this kid's anaphylaxis. And somebody said, let's walk, wash off the child in case that was there. And they scrubbed the kid from head to toe to get everything off. Um, and that was when they were finally able to stop it because as long as the substance is there, the child's body is going to continue to react to it. Now, follow up, everybody should get an EpiPen who truly has anaphylaxis. Um, and I believe in allergy clinic follow ups. Um, number one, it confirms the diagnosis. Number two, it gives the family a time to talk to them about what they're allergic to, ways to stop them from being exposed, um, and also kind of planning on where they're going to have their EpiPens and how they're going to be able to access them. And I talked very fast, which is probably good. Any questions for me? Thanks, Ian. That was, that was excellent, as always. I think, Natalie, you had a question for Dr. Dietrich. Is, it, is that right? Yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Dietrich. It's Natalie. Uh, oh, wow. thanks, thanks for sharing that topic. Um, I liked the emphasis on um, the early epi, not being afraid to do that. Um, I, I was initially going to ask about kind of the recommended monitoring period after a patient gets epi, um, but you kind of covered that at the end there. So I guess um, could you maybe address, you know, some tips if um, there's Kind of some parental refusals or hesitation to transport the child after receiving epi or maybe they didn't receive it yet but there's some concern kind of how to address that you know that's a very good point um if you've ever seen i am epi given to anyone it, it is not what i would like to say is one of the top three drugs um, that parents or children would like 
um, because you do get that really fast heart rate. You do get, you know what I mean, that whole epi through the body. Um, having said that, um, most of the time, the parents, um, child's truly having anaphylaxis, it's pretty easy for the parents to see that. Um, and so when they've got, you know, the diffuse hot, they've got angioedema um, and difficulty breathing, it is really easy to usually talk those types of families into giving the epi very quickly. Um, the biggest problem we have is parents being afraid to give it to their kids. So it's more of, can you please give it? I don't want to give it because I'm afraid I'll do it wrong or I'm afraid I, I'm scared um, is usually going to be the, the basic reaction that you get. Um, however, I have to say, if you get there and the kid has, you know, you'll see a kid and they've got two to three hives, they've got no respiratory difficulty, they're smiling and they're eating potato chips um, in the nurse's station, which we've all seen, you know what I mean? They get called for it. I have a hard time giving epi to that patient. So I would say take it with them, you know what I mean? I would transport if the parent believes that the child's been exposed to something they can anaphylax to. But at the same time, you know, kids that are eating chips and have no respiratory symptoms, it's hard to give the epi. The one thing I do encourage the families to do those is after, if they come to the emergency department and we watch them and they don't have a problem, is to go back and talk to their allergy. Because I do think some people are giving EpiPens a little too fast. Um, I, I have a friend who got one for her daughter having diarrhea with milk products. And I was like, she didn't get any high. Do you know what I mean? So. From my standpoint, I wouldn't give that child an EpiPen, you know, because they don't meet the definition for anaphylaxis. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's great. Thank you. That was a good point that you brought up, Natalie. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Dietrich? All right. Well, thank you very much, Ann. That was excellent. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody out there. You guys do an awesome job. We love you. So th that concludes our virtual EMS conference in the update. Uh, I want to thank our speakers again for your time and dedication to, to uh, the EMS update. Um, for our listeners, again, don't forget to check out our virtual content on our website. We have, or we have and will have several virtual EMS updates. Uh, Mark Huckabee has developed a new EMS Grand Round series uh, along with Barb Dean. We have our podcast links up there, and we have uh, several rapid-fire EMS videos for CE on the go. I want to thank Holly, uh, Mark, and Barb, and all others at Ohio Health EMS for their hard work in preparing for this conference. Uh, Janine and Natalie, thanks for your participation as well. For the listeners, feel free to reach out to, to Natalie and Janine. They are constantly reviewing new EMS studies and literature. They're looking and, and reassessing guidelines and protocols and performing CQI activities. And they're an excellent resource for you to contact. Uh, and lastly, I wanna thank our EMS providers for all that you do. As Ann said, we, we love you. We appreciate all of your hard work and dedication. Uh, and please feel free to contact me with any questions, concerns, or feedback at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. Holly, I'm going to hand it over to you for any closing remarks. Well, thank you. I just uh, want to uh, echo uh, your sentiments, Eric, that uh, we we uh, wish we could see you face to face. We know that's not possible. Uh, we hope that these uh, virtual series of uh, alternative education uh, conferences uh, are going to still um, make make us feel as if we can come together safely uh, virtually and uh, still continue to learn because that's uh, absolutely important. We have to keep learning and uh, improving and uh, refreshing uh, every day for our patients. And uh, we're hoping that this is, is a new and uh, good solution for you to continue your education. So thank you very much for participating and on behalf of Ohio Health, uh, thanks uh, so much for everything you do uh, every day. And we're here uh, as you need us. Thank you. All right. Thank you all and stay safe.